hope all are doing great as per the request from my lovely subscribers i have started making these videos on microstructure based modeling of metals in this series of videos i will be explaining how to perform microstructure based modeling using crystal plasticity finite element methods please do not forget to like my videos as this increases its chance to get higher rank in google algorithms and hence has more chance of getting to the users who are looking for such tutorials okay so let's get into the business uh, the outline of this video is we will first look into the deformation behavior of single crystal metals and try to establish what is needed to model such deformation then i will give a brief overview of crystal plasticity in the context of small strain formulation i will then explain what are hardening laws in the context of single crystal metals followed by Bassani and Wu model. Once we understood about the hardening model, I will explain what parameters are associated with the hardening model and how to identify them. Finally, I will give you a practical overview of one of the single crystal plasticity UMAR subroutine and its application via step-by-step -step abacus tutorial to simulate single and polycrystal FCC metals deformation. Okay, so when we talk about the plastic deformation in metals, especially at macro scale, we mention about yield strength and strain hardening. However, at micro scale and or meso scale, there could be a number of mechanisms which can cause plasticity in the material. For example, slip based plasticity, twinning induced plasticity, which is also known as TWIP or transformation induced plasticity which is also called trip in the literature so now let's look at each of these mechanisms very briefly and quickly before we jump into the theoretical part so when we talk about slip based plasticity as you see on the screen we have missing planes in the crystal structure as you see here and these are called line defects or dislocations. So when you apply loading, like in this case, we are applying this shear stresses, then these dislocations start to move uh, along the crystal, as you see here, and it, in this case, it moves out of this. And that dislocation motion is always along a certain plane in a certain direction, and that's why it's called a slip-based plasticity. People have done a lot of investigations on different types of materials. For example, here you can see the slip motion due to the dislocation gliding in, in a material which is monitored in situ under a TEM, which is transmission electron microscope. So you see how dislocations are moving, how they are gliding over one over the other. They are also having cross gliding as well. The second type of mechanism is called the twinning induced plasticity. In this case, you have a twin boundary. And instead of having dislocation slipping along a specific plane in a specific direction, you will have uh, the crystal which will twin and will form a mirror image of the other side of the crystal about that twinning boundary. As you can see here, this is a TEM image of that thing. And this is again a monitoring of the similar sort of material. This is a twin boundary and you see how twins are forming about that boundary. In this case, you have a lot of slip systems also getting activated and that's why you have dislocations which are moving towards the twin boundary and they are interacting with it. So it's a very complex phenomena when you look at uh, the plasticity at micro scale. Next mechanism which is called the transformation induced plasticity and in this case, you're, you don't have any dislocations or twinning which is happening here, but rather your crystal structure will transform to a new phase so for example in steels the austenitic phase can transform into martensitic phase and so fcc can change into an orthorhombic structure as you see here and that will cause a transformation induced plasticity in the material also for example if you are talking about the metastable beta titanium alloys and in that case you don't have austenitic phase you have a beta phase which is a BCC crystal. So in that case, it will be elongated and form an orthorhombic or body-centered tetragonal structure. And that will that is also a type of Martin site. So you will have kind of a transform phase transformation during the deformation, and that's called transformation-induced plasticity. 
So in today's uh, video, we will be focusing on slip-based plasticity and I will leave the twinning-induced plasticity and transformation-induced plasticity for future topics if there is any interest in that. Okay, so when you talk about the deformation in FCC single crystal, then we, as, as, I was, as I have shown you in this video as well, that your dislocations are moving in a certain direction along a certain plane. So in that case, for an FCC material, you will, there will always be four slip, which are of one, one, one type and slip will always take place along or in those one, one, one planes. And the direction will always be one, one, zero. So in total, you will have four possibilities of having one, one, one plane, and you can have three possibilities of having one, one, zero direction for each plane, as you see here. So this means four times three, you will have a possibility of 12 slip systems in FCC material. So your dislocation can basically move along a specific, any one of the 12 slip systems, which is there. And I will show you, I will discuss later on how you decide which slip system will have, will initiate the dislocation motion first. Okay, so as I told you before, there are many different length scales involved here. So you can model everything based on the dislocation density. So you can monitor or define the evolution of dislocations, how they are moving, how they are interacting, how they are evolving as, as the deformation is going on. And then based on that, you can find out the slip in that specific system due to those dislocation motions, which could be like monitoring of millions of dislocations in, in a specific material. And once you know the slip rate, then you can transform it to a plastic strain and then you use a typical plasticity theory uh, to compute the stresses and the other stuff. So let's look into that. In this case, what we're gonna use is, we're gonna use a very widely used crystal plasticity theory, which was developed by Rice, Hill and Azaro. And this framework I'm gonna use to explain this theory. And I will start it with a small strain context because uh, we will try to keep our life simple, but the theory itself is implemented in a finite strain formulation. And for such cases, you might already know that you require the deformation gradients rather than the strains. And for deformation gradients, once you use those, then you need to find out the corresponding stresses and the strains which are conjugate to each other. So again, you see you're already getting bored. So I will keep everything simple to make you understand or familiarize with the crystal plasticity theory. And then I will, I will just move towards the finite deformation case. So let's look at the framework. The first thing for any plasticity theory is how to find the stresses or stress rates in a time dependent domain. So for that, you need to first define a kinematics. So in this case, kinematics is the total strain rate, which is the sum of the elastic strain rate and the plastic strain rate. Once we know somehow the plastic strain rate, then we can subtract it from the total strain rate, which is generally the applied strain on the, on the material. So this subtraction will give us the elastic strain rate. And when we have the elastic strain rate, we can multiply it with the elasticity tensor using the Hooke's law. And that will give us the stress rate because everything is in terms of time derivative. So that's why we call it rates. So next thing is how to find the plastic strain rates because that's the unknown for us right now. So for plastic strain rates, we need to know how much slip rate is happening in alpha slip system. So in, remember, in the case of FCC, we had 12 slip systems. So we have to really compute this strain, shear strain rate or slip rate in each of the slip system. Then we have to use the mu ij, which is also known as the orientation tensor. And sometimes it's called the Schmidt factor as well. So that depends on the vector, which is tangent to the slip system alpha. And, and the dyadic product with the vector normal to the slip system alpha. So you define the orientation of that specific slip system. You multiply it with the shear, stra shear strain rate, and that will give you the plastic strain rate uh, after transforming it. And you have to do it for all the slip system to get the total plastic strain rate in the crystal. Okay, so again, things are getting complicated. The only thing unknown now is Okay, I know this thing based on the geometry, so I can define for all 12 slip system what is the orientation tensor or Schmidt factor. But how to compute the slip rate? So again, for slip rate or plastic slip rate in slip system alpha, there are number of relationships available. In this case, Hutchinson presented a creep type formulation for the slip rate. 
which is a function of the reference strain rate gamma naught dot resolve shear stress in that specific slip system alpha and also the strength of the slip system g alpha m is a material parameter and we call it viscoplastic exponent so if you have a time dependent behavior depending on the loading then you can use a smaller value of m and then you have to fine tune it with the experimental data if you have a rate independent theory then you can use a large value of m and then your your material formulation will automatically become rate independent so how fast or how slow the load you will apply will have almost no effect on the stress strain curve okay so now the, what is unknown is tau alpha and g alpha which is the resolved shear stress and the strength of the slip system alpha so let's first look at the resolved shear stress and resolved shear stress is very similar to how we computed the plastic strain rate so resolved shear stress will be equal to the stress tensor times the Schmidt factor so this will give us the resolved shear stress and again you can see stress is the same throughout the crystal but this factor will dominate how high it is and the higher the value of the resolved shear stress more chance of getting the gamma dot value so this means that this the slip system with the highest Schmidt factor will definitely contribute more towards the slip now next thing so we can compute it with this the next thing which is remaining is the strength of the slip system and the strength of the slip system is defined as the hardening moduli h alpha beta times the slip rate which is coming from this evolution equation so h alpha beta is the hardening moduli of slip system alpha and in this case in this formulation which i am going to show you today uh, we have done our own implementation as well but to to make it more public domain thing i'm going to use a subroutine which was developed by professor huang and i'm going to show you that at the end of the theoretical part when i will show you the step-by-step -step tutorial so now we already have an understanding of the crystal plasticity framework i hope if you have any questions about this then please write in the comments below and i will definitely show uh, explain further if it is required if we have a lot of finite strain theory then instead of having this strain added together you will have a total deformation gradient which should be equal to the elastic deformation gradient times the plastic deformation gradient so things change for finite deformation and things get more complicated because then you have to understand the stresses and strains which are conjugated to each other and i don't want to get you lost in the continuum mechanics right now but i want to give you a flavor of how this whole thing works so here you can now see that previously when i was showing you those dislocations so we have nowhere in this model that dislocations or dislocation densities but we are having a slip rate or slip in the material based on the strength and resolve shear stress so we are not really monitoring the evolution of the dislocation densities here but there are many theories which are available and which basically define this gamma dot alpha in terms of the evolution of the dislocation densities so again that's a very different story and again i will explain that in future videos what is left behind is this hardening moduli because this is the only unknown which is left here because in order to compute gamma dot alpha we need g dot alpha which is the strength of the slip system and for that we need hardening moduli so for hardening moduli there are again a range of hardening moduli available which depends on the type of crystal you are trying to model and what sort of a stress strain response it's showing i'm going to discuss a bassani and wu model which is more flexible in a way and it is more complicated than the other models which are available because it can model three stage hardening in the single crystalline material and if you use any other model they have the similar philosophy or similar principles can be applied as you can see in this model so what you see is the model basically is motivated from the fact that experimentally people have found that many metals especially fcc metals show three stage hardening such as copper for example so in those cases you will have initially uh, one of the slip systems will get activated which will be a primary slip system and then followed by secondary slip systems which will start to activate and they will start to interact with each other as well so initially you will have only one slip system which will show resistance to the plastic deformation but then you will have more slip system getting activated and they are also interacting with each other so you have a higher hardening in the crystalline behavior and then you reach to a point where everything starts to saturate and you start to move towards failure so to define this three stage hardening the best possibility was to use some kind of analytical function which was derived by Bassani and Wu 
and in this case you need to define two levels of hardening so so try to understand again as i explained before you will have a primary slip system which is activating first and which is showing hardening as well and then you will have secondary slip system which will also activate and then start interacting with each other so in order to do that you need to define the self hardening which is the hardening of the primary slip system or any slip system due to uh, due to the resistance in itself when it's deforming and then you have to define the latent hardening which is the interaction of one slip system or hardening in the one slip system due to the other slip system so that's called the latent hardening so to define the self hardening because it's the hardening due to the same slip system they call it h alpha alpha and it has a lot of number material parameters so you see it's all day de depending on this kind of mathematical three st stage hardening function so in this case if you use this h alpha alpha and you plot it in terms of gamma alpha which is the shear strain on the horizontal side and uh, then horizontal axis sorry so you will say that the slip will start at tau naught which is initial resolved shear stress or yield strength initial yield strength of the slip system in this case and the hardening or initial hardness is H0. So this is the H0 here, which is a parameter there. Similarly, you keep on deforming it until you reach to a uh, resolved shear stress value of tau s. After that, this H0 will change and saturate to a new hardening value, which is Hs, which is given here. And once it is done there, so you have kind of taken into account the stage one hardening, you will have the other slip systems which will start to activate. And once they start to activate, you have to have an interaction term because the slip systems will be interacting with each other. And for that, they use this term G. What is this G? They define this G as an, an, another analytical function. And in this case, it's a function of one plus F alpha beta. This is the interaction term between the slip system alpha and other slip systems, other 11 slip system for the case of FCC times the tangent hyperbolic function. And this gamma beta is the total slip beta, beta systems over the gamma naught which is a material parameter so in this way they, they 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 kind of use this interaction term to increase the hardness or hardening moduli of the system for a stage two until they reach to a point where a stage three comes into play and then everything saturates to zero or whatever so so this is how they define it for latent hardening term they use there are again many different ways of defining it most of the time people don't use latent hardening because they already have this interaction term and they calibrate all the parameters based on this but if you really want to define it then you can people have defined the latent hardening using this kind of relationship where latent hardening moduli is a function of material parameter q latent hardening coefficient times the self-hardening moduli so in a very simplified way so now if you understood the model which defines a three-stage hardening there are some very simplified models like there's a very famous model pierce azaro and needleman model that's called pen model in that case they don't use hs so if you remove hs and if you remove this term and this term then what will happen is this will go like this and then it will saturate and that's for normal other crystals which doesn't show any kind of strain hardening and then also three stage for deformation so you can use that simplified version as well and this can be converged to that as well if you remove some of these variables or make those values to zero anyways in this case if you're going to use this kind of model we need to identify seven different parameters tau naught h naught which is initial hardening tau s which is a saturation resolved shear stress and hs is the saturated hardening and then gamma naught after which interaction will start to play a significant role and then q is the uh, latent hardening parameter while f alpha beta is the interaction parameter again to identify these parameters is is a bit complicated if you have a single crystal data and you have performed a single crystal stress strain testing then you can read these values directly from that experimental data but if you don't have it then in such cases you can use different other techniques and again i will get back to those in in future videos for the timing we will assume that we already have the data from single crystalline stress strain testing or uniaxial testing and we're going to use it directly okay so i hope this is clear again if you have any other model which you are want to understand or if you have any question related to that then please uh, write in the below and i will definitely try to answer your questions okay so now we have covered most of the theoretical part and i have bored you enough so let's go and have a look 
at the crystal plasticity UMAT subroutine and try to understand what is required to make your job run and predict the deformation in FCC single crystals and also polycrystals. And at this time, I will again remind you to please uh, like the video so that at least I will get some motivation as well. So again, so see you on the other side. Thank you. Okay, so welcome to the front side of the subroutine and the input file. So first I will give you a brief on how this subroutine really looks like. And then I will give you what is needed to be defined in terms of the material constants in Abacus input file. And then I will construct a model in Abacus and I will show you how you can uh, you transform that simple elastic model into a crystal plasticity based model. So firstly the subroutine, if you are not familiar with Abacus subroutine, especially the humor subroutine, then I would highly recommend you to go and look at the video on the UMAT subroutine which I made few some time ago and where I showed you how to implement the elastic theory in UMAT where I explain each and every variable which is required for the UMAT subroutine. So if you look at this subroutine this is a typical subroutine and then at the end you will have an subroutine command in between you have to define all the stuff and declare all the stuff so this subroutine, which is a UMAT subroutine, is divided into, or it has further subroutines inside it. One is called the rotation subroutine. And in, in this subroutine, you need to define the orientation of the single crystal in the local coordinates. So you have to define the vectors of the local coordinates of the crystal in a global coordinate system. So I will show you how you do it. So what this subroutine does, it constructs this rotation matrix and it finds those angles which which which, has, which which will tell the software that okay what is the orientation of the crystal normally when you do EBSD you get Euler angles and many other cores which I will again discuss in future and uh, directly to take those Euler angles so I'm not sure what was the reason behind doing this but I think Euler angles are more convenient but again this this just makes everything independent of angles which are coming from your EBSD data or whatever other information you have so this is the first subroutine. Then you have a slip system subroutine, slipsys, and this calculates the number of slip systems. Again, you will have to define the, those that what slip systems are there, and then it will calculate the directions and normals in the initial stage depending on the orientation. Then you have a G slip initiation initial subroutine, and it calculates the initial value of the current strength of the initial slip system. If you remember the theory, that G alpha term, so it's basically G alpha not so for each slip system, it will compute this value, initial value of this. Then the strain rate parameter, so a strain rate subroutine basically is based on the current values of resolved shear stress, current strength, which is coming from G, and then calculate the shear strain rate, which was gamma dot alpha in that theory slide, which I showed you. Uh, latent hardening can calculates both the self and latent hardening matrix, so H alpha alpha and H alpha beta, which again, I gave you the relationship for Bassani and Wu model, but there, there is another model here as well, which is called Pierce SR or Needleman model. So you can use any one of those. The nitration matrix basically defines that, okay, how the neutron drops nitration is done because every same thing is implemented in an implicit manner. So they need to use nonlinear solver. And in this case, they're using neutron drops nitration. Then these are LU decomposition and linear equation solver, which is again a, a simple mathematical subroutine which comes from the library so they you, you will find these subroutines in many subroutines many other programs as well so you can have a look at that how they are implemented so other than that there will there are there is a program sub function which is f and in this case they define the shear strain rates in each slip system so it computes that for them and then it transfer back to the strain rate subroutine then the, the variables which needs to be updated again if you know don't know about the variables, I will highly recommend you to go back and look at my UMAT subroutine about elastic solids I, where I have explained each and everywhere parameter in detail. But uh, just to give you a brief that for UMAT, you need to update stresses, state variables and Jacobian, which so they, in, in UMAT terminology, it's called DDS, DDE. So you need to define a Jacobian matrix, a state variable and the stresses you have to update. What variables which are passed as an input there is are the total strains so again all the six components of a strain if it's a 3d problem increments of a strain again all the all the components 
the name of the material which is again defined in abacus what is the name of the material and then the number of directions number of direct stresses number of shear stresses and the total number of stress components you will have then n state variable defines how many state solution dependent state variables will be uh, there and again you will have to define the value of this in the input file as static depth variable which is a dependent solution dependent state variable numbers i will come back to that later on how many you need then you have to define all the properties of the material so these are all material constants which are uh, related, related to the crystal plasticity and so all those hardening moduli and you know all those m parameter and everything has to be defined in these in the input file and then it, this and props define the how many number of constants are needed for that specific crystal so again everything is implemented as i told you in the theory and i'm not going to go into the numerical implementation but i'm just going to explain how the subroutine really is constructed or structured so we now understand we need to define some of these variables like nstat in the dev variable command number of properties we have to define how many constants are required and then we have to give the values for each of these constants these comes from the model if it's a three-dimensional model and tens will be six and this will be three and three number of name of the material again you have to define an abacus and the strain increments come from the loading which you are applying on your structure so that that comes from abacus and you have your due responsibility in any UMAT subroutine is to update the stresses, state variables, which are solution dependent state variables, and the Jacobian matrix for implicit solvers. So, again, you can read through the documentation. It's a very well written subroutine. This was first written by Professor Huang. He is nowadays in Northwestern University. And then it has been modified by other, people's, uh, other people as well. For example, Pro Professor Kaiser from Columbia University and we have also modified it and used uh, i mean implemented many new things in the subroutine as well but this is just the basic first basic version of their subroutine another important thing is how to define the number of state variables in the depth variable command how will you find out okay what is the number of state variables right so it depends on the crystal plasticity theory and the crystal type you are using so generally this state variable number you will have to define as 10 times the total number of slip systems and SLPTL is a total number of slip systems plus 5 so you have to define let's say if you have 12 slip system in a FCC crystal then it will be 12 times 10 which is 120 plus 5 so you have to give 125 as a an state variable num that variable number in input file again I will show you how you do that then there are some explanation for that so this is all related to that and Yep, and then you have the declarations for different variables. You have you. It also tells you what what variable is what, so you can again read through it. You don't need all these information if you are not going through it unless you want to modify the subroutine. In this case, so these are all different variables which are explained there, and then here they explain that how these state variables are defined. So when you give a value of one twenty five, for example, so from one to number of slip systems, total number of slip systems, which is 12 for FCC so 1 to 12 will be the current strength so they will be stored in STV state variable 1 to state variable 12 then from 13 to 24 will be the shear strain which is the gamma alpha in each slip system and then and then so on so resolved shear stress is basically this times this so you can you can compute so for example if you want to take the output of all 125 state variable your file can get really big so maybe if you are interested in any one of the quantities you can just read through that number here say that i need a state variable 50 for example then that and then you can ask for the output for that so this gives you explicitly which number of a state variable is what quantity basically so you can again look into the subroutine to that for props again they have given you the values from 1 to 21 props are basically elastic constants you can define a isotropic constants where which will be from one and two because you need only two properties rest of them will be zero again uh, remember that when you are defining the abacus input file the maximum data in each line abacus input file can take is eight constants right so if you are defining only isotropic material this means you only give the value one and value two and then rest of the values will be zero so all the six values will be zero in that line similarly rest of the other quantities will be zero so abacus will automate the subroutine automatically is defined in a way that it assumes that everything is isotropic most of the cubic crystals are uh, defined using cubic symmetry 
So in this case, we will be defining C11, C12, and C44 as elastic constants. So we need to define three constants, one, two, and three, and rest of the variables will be zero. So just to give you an example of how it looks like, so for example, this is the material card, user material, and we are giving a total constant 160 in this case for FCC material, and we are using unsymmetric properties in solver. So here you have, they have defined the cubic symmetry, so they define the first value, comma the second value, comma the third value. And then it can also have further five values, but since it's a cubic symmetry, they don't need those values, so they haven't defined it. So when the input file is read by Abacus, it will automatically take the rest of the values in this same line as zero, which means the next five values, which were supposed to be there, will be taken as zero. Similarly, in the next line, if you define zero, then everything else is zero as well. So if you go back now for cubic symmetry, you have only three constants. So again, you need only one. For orthotropic properties, you need nine properties, right? D111 until nine properties. So again, first eight will go in the first line and the second line will have the last property, which is D2323. If you have anisotropic material, then you have to define 21 constants, which is the maximum number you can have. And in that case, you will again define first eight, second eight, that will be 16 and then rest of them will be in the third line. And that's what you see here. So first line for elastic constant, second line, and then third line for the star elastic constant. So if you have anisotropic material, you will have eight, eight, 16, and then you can have further eight as well, which is 24, but for elastic, you need only 21. So this, mean, this means you have, you don't need extra three. So you will only define eight minus three, five, five constants here, and then rest will be zero. Okay, I hope this is clear. This is how it works in Abacus. So you can define that then from 25 until 56 are the parameters which characterize all the slip systems. And for a cubic crystal, you will have prop 25, which will tell Abacus, okay, how many number of slip system families are there? So for example, for FCC crystal, as I told you, you have only one family, which is a 111 type in a 110 direction. So you can have four times three, 12 slip systems of one 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 type so you will write here one and that's what you see uh, this is all the definition here this is what you see here number of set, sets of slip system or families of slip system so in fcc it is only one now remember if you have like bcc crystal then you can have one family of one one zero type one family of one one two type and one family of one one two three type so in that case you will write here three so depending on the number of families you have to write the number of sets basically this is not the number of slip systems. Remember, this is number of families. So for FCC, we have only one family of 110, 111 type. For BCC, it will be 123 type, 112 type, and 110 type. So we write it three. Okay, so this is the first thing. Then from 33 to 35, you will have to define the slip system normals and slip system. That is, sorry, not normal to the typical slip system, slip plane. And then you have to define that slip direction as well in from 36 to 38. So that's what is done here. In this case, we had only one set. So we can have, we will have a combination of 111 slip system plane in 110 direction. We, we keep the rest of the two zero because we can have eight values here, but we only define six. And now what Abacus will do or the subroutine will do it once it identified it only has one family. This means it's an FCC crystal with one, one, one type. So it will automatically generate all the 12 slip systems for you which is a good thing about subroutine this subroutine and again it can also transform it to the global coordinate as well based on the orientation tensor in this case we don't have the second and third family so they have used zeros here but you can define that those as well if you have a bcc but then you have to use that specific number of slip systems there so i hope this this block is clear which is all about slip systems number of families of slip systems slip plane and slip directions Next is the very tricky part as I don't like that thing basically. So that is basically to define, uh, this is all that thing. So this is now prop 57 to 72 basically characterizes the initial orientation of single crystal. So what you have to do, you have to define the direction of the first vector in the local cubic system. So in the local direction, let's say if your crystal is oriented in a such a where you say that, okay, one of the vertex is 0, 0, 0, and then you have 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. Then you can define on those local coordinates there. And then 
in the second part you have to define which axis of the local coordinate local coordinate of the cubic crystal is or is aligned with the global system so you see here in this case if you look at this block here which defines this whole thing so the local system which is minus one zero one is aligned with the global zero zero one system zero zero one coordinate vector and similarly zero one zero is defined as zero one zero so this means local z is defined local y is with the is aligned with the local global y axis as well so this way you can define the orientation other subroutines even I, which I, I can as i said before directly takes the euler angles so you don't need to worry about this but in this case you have to be careful how you are how your crystal is really, really oriented uh, in the global system because this will decide okay what is the orientation of the crystal itself so this is basically that and i hope this is clear and then once you have defined all those vectors you go to the next parameter characterization and now you start to go towards the evolution of slip which is what the power law relationship if you remember so you define the parameters for the first set and then second set the third set so again if you go back to the input file this is the m parameter and in that subroutine we had this m and then this is the gamma naught dot parameter so they use a dot here so for the first set right so they are using a high value of n again if you use a very high value to be the safe side that will make everything rate independent similarly you have to do the same for the second family and third family but since we had only one family here so we have defined zeros for the second and third family now comes the part that okay we need to define the hardening law so again if you so this is again the same thing self and latent hardening parameters so first line will define all those parameters like h naught tau naught tau s tau naught hs and f alpha beta if you remember and and then also the q parameter q parameter which is here so this way you define the hardening model in this case they have defined it for pen type model which was second hyperbolic function and it saturates as i told you in the discussion and this defines the latent hardening so q is the latent hardening due to the due to the interaction with the same family of slip system but if you have the two families of slip system then you can have a one 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 zero system interacting with one two three system so in that case you have to define q1 which, in, which basically characterizes that again if you look at the documentation it also very well explains everything which is from professor huang so they explain everything how to be defined so if i go back to that thing because you want to see how they have defined the lit Bassani and Wu model so you see for Bassani and Wu model you need to define h naught tau s tau naught then hs gamma naught then gamma i so gamma naught is basically you remember that saturation point for the same family and then this is the, for the interaction with the other family of slip system similarly this is the interaction term f alpha beta for the same family and when it interacts with the other family then it uses this value in, in our case it's only one parameter so we will use zero zeros or whatever value we use here for these two it's not gonna make any difference but if you have bcc where you have three families then you have to be careful about these parameters as well and same applies to the latent hardening as well so in our case for fcc this is the only valid parameter okay so this is for the latent hardening and self-hardening for second family again everything is zero 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 so we don't need anything next thing is we have to define the enteric in a implicit integration scheme so they use a value of theta 0.5 for it can vary from 0 to 1 again you need to go and look at the integration scheme theory and when you use a value of 1.0 this means it's going to use a non-linear geometric option in abacus and you basically can uh, use that for large deformations also since it's a non-linear solver so it has to do a lot of iteration so basically it says if you are going to use an iterative sol solver you need to use one here if you don't need any iteration and just accept the solution then you use uh, zero here and then it will not iterate and it will take up the solution whichever comes from the first one because there is an explicit way of doing it as well if you move from zero to one similarly the error in the gamma is given as well if you have, want a smaller error you can make it very small as well but then it will take more time to converge and it will do maximum number of 10 iterations for each newton robson algorithm and here as i told you before your number of state variables should be 12 times 10 plus 5 and that comes out to be 125 so so in this in this case it will be 125 so this is wrong 
okay and then rest is the just boundary condition loading step definition basically so this is all step definition so i hope it's clear how to define all these i quickly went through it but if you have any questions then please comment below and i will explain in more detail okay now let, let me quickly show you how to create a simple model one element model for example and then play around with the parameters so i will just create a 3d deformable solid extrusion object i will create a rectangle let's say from 0 0 to 1 comma 0 oops we need to give uh, 0 comma 0 and then 1 comma 1 to make it a square and then for extrusion also i'm going to use one and this is how my cube looks like so i'm just going to create a one element model and then i will show you how you can play around with this stuff then the next thing is basically properties so i cannot define all the constants here so i prefer you can do it here as well because then you have to go and give all the material constants here as well but in my case i just define it as elastic let's say just give any fictitious value everything i'm assuming here as millimeters so one millimeter by one millimeter cube but uh, i so i just give some value here then i will assign it to the part here and when the color changes to green it's assigned next i bring it to assembly module and i will instance the part here next i will define a simple step general static general because it's a umat we're going to use i will turn on the u and assume here as well if you remember in the umat also you can call it but i will just keep to be on the safe side i will do that i'm going to run it for one second and i will start with a zero zero point zero one and then i will say zero okay and then also for the output what i'm going to do here is i'm going to ask it to give me the state variables as output as well because right now it's elastic it will not give me but when you select this it will definitely uh, work for you if the file is too big then you can selectively select specific outputs as well in the input file and then that will be fine as well so here i have asked for that and then there is no interaction loading wise again i'm going to apply uni excel loading so i'm going to fix three phases i'll fix this phase i will about x i will fix this in the x direction i will fix uh, this one in z direction and i will fix the bottom one so this is more this is a typical uni excel test condition and we normally use it to identify material parameters and this will be u too so hopefully now it is fixed and now i can apply a displacement on this side you can apply a force as well it's fine i'm going to go with the displacement here subroutine works both ways so it should be in uz and i will give a value of minus 0.2 just 20 percent of a strain or something to be on the safe side okay so this is a uni excel test condition now these two faces are free so they can contract and this can pull in this direction so you can use this kind of boundary condition to identify material parameters as well if you have uni excel data now for this i will use the seeds and in this case i'm going to use a seed of size one so that i only have one element here so you see it's only one element if you look at the bottom now if you see look at the properties here so i have to select 3d stress standard linear core reduce integration element and maybe i can in use enhance hourglass stiffness it's not going to change anything because it's all constrained well but it is recommended to do that so optimization we don't need so i'll go here i'll create a job i'll call cpfem try one or something because normally these analysis never work as we always fun make fun of us and then i will write input file i'm not going to do anything i'm just going to write input file so now this is the file which was written i'm just going to open it again in my notepad here so that is there so now if you look closely to this file this is the element definition this is the assembly definition and this is where the material card is there so in this case you remember we define the elastic constant so what i normally do i just go back to the subroutine oops and the input file here and i just copy the material card fully here so for example what i do i use this material name crystal so instead of that i'm just copy everything below this because it defines the user material 
how many constants and then unsymmetric so i will just copy everything and it copies the def variable as well so we don't need to define manually and then i go back to my oops here and i copy it here so it will replace that elastic definition with this right now it's all related to the pen type model but again as i told you from the pdf you can define the other constant it will become that so right now the orientation is something like this and we have everything set up correctly and the dev variable is which we supposed to define is also there and we have also asked for sdvs so it will write all the sdvs as well okay so now let me try to run it so these are the files there i need to run this file input file along with the user material subroutine which i showed you so i will use the command abacus job equals uh, cpfem you can remove the input, dot input thing and then you have to say user and then you have to give the umat name here and oops so there is something missing so crystal oh, it should be crystal and this and then double and double precision i always go for and interactively and then i press enter and you see it has compiled without any problem link it has linking it has linked it as well and now it's running and it will be a quick run because it's just a simple one element model My system is running other jobs as well so it might be taking slightly longer so now if you look at the status file then that will give you that okay everything went well and since we gave a smaller increment so it went and maximum was 0.1 so it incre increased incrementally and we finished in no time everything was completed successfully okay so let's open the file and see how it looks like so this is the thing you can see the stresses are going up to these values and you can see all the sdvs are output as well so again to see what sdv each sdv is if you want to see the current strength of slip system then it's 1 to 12 if you want to see the gamma value shear strain value then it is from 13 because ns total number of slip systems were 12 plus 1 so 13 to 24 so if you want to see the slip system uh, individual slip system slip then you should start from 13 Again, in this case, it's zero. Some might be activated, some might not be activated. As you can see, this slip system is activated. The other one was not. So depending on the orientation, different slip systems may behave differently. So this slip system might have a very small uh, orientation tensor or shimmer factor, so it didn't get activated. So you can see the different activities as well of slip system. And also you can do is an easy way to compare it. If you go create XY data field output, and then you can say integration point and then you can say okay i want to print from 13 from 13 14 15 16 because i all i want to see all 12 strip system how they are behaving in this this case so you can basically plot them as xy data as well again you can play around and you can see what is really needed so again you can select the element and plot and you see some of them are zero some of them are going in positive slip direction some are negative depending on the orientation of the slip systems and these are all the slip system colors so this way you can again see what you really want so i hope you can now simulate the single crystal what i can do also is i can basically let's say so data create field output and instead of having all slip systems here I can ask for stress so for example me is stress if i plot that select the element first and then plot so it looks something like this uh, again you can use a smaller time increment to get a better convergence as well and then i will save it so now i have my xy data manager and i have saved the stress value here now what i do i go back i close this odb and I will run with a different orientation to show you that there is an orientation effect. So if I go back to my input file, I can just go into the input file here and I can change the orientation by changing these vectors. So instead of using these minus one, this, I will say, okay, that zero, zero, one is, or is aligned with zero, zero, one. So it's very much the same as the, it's the same orientation 
uh, with the globe aligned with the global system so let's see if there's an effect of that or not i'm just using random you can have your own random extreme orientations as well depending on the ebsd data now if i run it again and i will get back once it's finished okay so let's see how it looks like for the other case so what i have done i have i finished the simulation for the other case and then i plotted the same way as i did before the stress and you can see the stresses look very different for the other case so this is a new one this was the previous run which i showed you so you see the elastic constants are changed because the cubic symmetry we have used so changing the orientation is affecting the elastic properties and also you see the yielding is changing as well and you, you if you plot the slip system activity you again will find a lot of differences as well because depending on the orientations so i hope now you are able to do th single crystal simulation uh, in reality polycrystal simulations are very expensive so if you want to do a 3d simulation if let's say if i show you what you have to do in simple terms uh, again you can create a 2d planar deformable object i can just create a random thing and then press done and then what i can do i can you can basically generate the microstructure you need a microstructure as a, as a model here so i'm just going to do do some partitioning here now and so you can just create some random lines here something like this and then press escape then again this then again So I'm just creating a random microstructure here, but again, you can use Napper. Napper is a software, free software, which is available. You can generate microstructure from there. You have to give EBSD data there as well. So again, this is enough, I think, by just partition. So now you see I have partition and I've just created different partitions here. So now what I can do in the property module, uh, I can create as many materials I want. So I, in this case, let's say if I have one, two, three, four, five, six grain, so I have to create six materials. So I will create material two. Again, I give a value of, let's say one, 0 0.3 and so on. And similarly, I can just copy these materials as well. So material three, three, and then copy another one, material four, and then material five. and then material six so once i have done that then i have to do the same with the solid section so i will create first section two with material two then solid section with material three section then again a solid section with material four then i will do the same as five i'm doing it very quickly but I, you can slow it down there is a function in YouTube which can do that. And please, at this point, you like my videos because I'm really struggling with the likes. So you see, I have all one, two, three, four, five, six sections with different material properties. So I can assign each section with a different section property. So section one will have material one. Then section two will have section two. Grain three will have section three. Grain four will have section four grain five will have section five and grain six will have section six so if they are assigned correctly you can basically see them here as well uh, here if you can want to say that okay property or material type then it will show in different colors so you you have to assign different material properties to it so once you have done that you can export it and if i can I will have to remove the other model now. So maybe I save this as uh, CP try one and then I will save it as CP try two 2D poly, something like this. And then what I have to do, I have to now remove everything. So I will remove this part from the assembly because I don't need that and I will bring my new part which is part two which is this one and now I have to define the step I think step is already there so we're not going to do anything with that 
but for the loading you might have to again carefully see because in this case i can again apply unique excel case so i can say that okay modify the region and i will select this and this as the region and i will fix in x direction then i will fix this bottom as y direction so if this is the y one uh, done and i will fix it in y direction so previous one was x yep and then i don't need this one most probably and i will add this one and i will select again maybe the these edges and maybe i will pull in one direction and it will be one or something maybe 0 0.01 or something so once i am done with that i have to go and mash it so again i'm going to use again mashing should be careful because it's going to take a long time as well even though it's 2d but i will leave it for you guys to play around so now we have matched it so next thing is job i will create uh, c p f e and try to poly something like this and then i will write it down and i will write an input file now and now i, I will show you how to run it you see here is the file and you see now it has a lot of nodes and elements and if you go down you have a step definition and you have these material definitions so what you have to do now for each material card you have to copy the same thing as we did last time from this input file for example so everything we will copy is from the material this name we will copy everything below this so here we are and then i go here and for each material definition i will basically copy it material one it's a tedious job for each grain so if you have 100 grains you might have to do it for 100 you can write a python script as well to do to the, do this to do this for you and once i have done that now what i have to do for each material i have to go so this is a lot of data now see the file is getting bigger but what i have to do now is i have to go back to material one first here so material one i if i because the properties are the same only thing is the orientation which changes in same material so we need to change the orientation so this one you can keep like this the second one let's say it was the second material here here you have to use a different orientation so again you can change it to let's say minus one and so on so you change orientations and everything for each each grain here manually or you can write a python script as i said and then you have to go and run in abacus and once you run it then you can again plot get a very nice plot of slip systems and everything inside the grain and you will see how their grains are really interacting with each other okay so i ran the job as you can see here and it finished without any problems and if i now show you the results so these are the results here so as you can see you can start with the stress distribution then you can see they look something like this so i'm pulling in this direction if you remember and these these are the grains so this is one grain two three four five six grains and each of them had random orientation so if i show you the orientations as well just to be sure so you can see that each orientation had i have given some random orientation so you see this grain had this orientation with respect to the local coordinate then the other one had other grain had this orientation and so on so as i showed you before you have to do it manually in this case or you can write python script again this orientation data should come from your ebsd analysis or if you have some other data available anyway so you can see different stress distribution although the mesh is not fine so i won't say take these as a final result and i need to do some mesh sensitivity analysis but just to, just to show you that okay you see different stress distributions you can also monitor for example the slip system activity so if you remember from 13 to 24 is the gamma value for each slip system so this is slip system one and you see the slip is around 0 0.0036 and this one is the only one which has that slip system activated rest have all zero so so this orientation is more favorable for this one 
then you can go and plot the other slip system so in this case this green had at the green boundary you have this slip system getting activated but again the value is very low so i would take it as zero so so i think this is not significant here in this case also you see there is a negative slip in this for this slip system with the plot with this thing so each system so basically it can also measure positive or negative depending on the direction of slip and you can see again this one is maximum while the rest of the stuff is zero almost so this grain is more favorable to starting uh, start at the start with the deformation you can see again this is almost zero so i'm going to ignore that then this one also has some negative and then some positive slip and again you can see this grain is more favorable to this one this sdv 17 slip system then this one is almost zero i'm again going to ignore that so this way i think you can see basically in each each family out of the 12 slip system which is activated for which orientation or which grain also so this way you can see the last one as well so this is the last one now how to find out okay what is which slip system is sdv24 for example so for that you need to go to the dat file here and if you go to the bottom of the dat file then it prints all the slip systems which were generated by you so we had only one family so it generated 12 slip system of 111 110 type and these are the ones so first one will be 13 14 15 16 until 24 so this way you can identify that okay for that grain if it was sdb 24 this slip system is more dominant in these grains for example so you can again analyze the data critically and see which orientation is more favorable to which system and and so on you can also look at the other parameters as well i think there was one parameter for the total slip which gives you the total plastic slip in the in the all the grains so let me see if i can find that information in the subroutine so if i go back here and get the subroutine oh, i think it should be already there uh, yeah, here so if i go back to that thing then you see the total cumulative shear strain which is the sum of all the slips and then you can use this to get the total plastic strain as well is net 121 so if i look at sdv 121 that will give me the cumulative total plastic slip so let's go and look for sdv 121 and this is uh, this is the value of that again this value is too large and that's why everything has become blue so i think this is uh, this is again mashing problem because this you see elements are not really having a nice aspect ratio and also it's near to the boundary so i let let me just remove this problem by giving a maximum value well the minimum value to be the same and the maximum let's start the minimum value from zero and maximum value to be 0 0.0 0.0143 for example so for example this is again so you just have to play with this so so if i select this value then you can see it ranges from this and again you can play around with this to find the distribution so again you can see the more slip is in these sides and this grain has highest amount of slip and also these these grains are more resistant to slip as well as far in terms of total slip as well so this way you can play around with this contour plots as well to to get some meaningful results and again you see there is an effect of green boundaries as well you can see a transition from this slip to almost negative slip or zero slip so again you can play around with that so i hope you are able to do this kind of analysis using this also there are sometimes you are looking for the grain rotations as well so i think somewhere yeah slip directions and normals so, so you can basically see see 36 37 until uh, 6 12 uh, 72 so from, from 36 to 72 you can see the orientations as well of the slip system how they are changing as well so let's let me plot something let's say 65 and i need to change this to default so you see these grains are were like this first so there was no orientation change and then as the deformation goes on your orientation starts to 
to change and you have grain rotations around start to happen so again this is very small deformation but for very large deformation you might have sub grain rotations which you want to monitor so you can again do that here as well so this is it for now i think i hope you enjoyed this trip to crystal plasticity and how you can model single crystal and polycrystal behavior using this publicly available subroutine if you have any more questions then please uh, comment below or get in touch with me and i will try to explain further so good luck and i hope you like my video as well and so please press the thumbs up if you have reached to this point and also write some appreciating comments as well at the below so below so that my videos get more higher ranking thank you very much and bye for now